Hello everyone. So for today's lesson in JavaScript, uh, basically there's three things I'm looking to uh, cover. Uh, the first one, I want to go through and do exercise 7-1 uh, with everyone. Uh, after we're done that, I have a special exercise I've prepared. This one will help us complete uh, the rest of the assignment, so exercise 7-2. It'll be very similar to that. Uh, and then I want to talk about the project. So I've been hearing from, from several of you that you've been finding the project difficult. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, there's a number of techniques uh, that uh, I feel if I um, go over with you, uh, you'll be able to get through some of your, uh, some of your difficulties uh, with the, uh, the project. Um, so, in the, and exactly what we're gonna look at with the project is the idea that every function you write, you're gonna want to immediately test it and also how to seek help. So when, when I'm programming something, uh, it's very, very common that I, whoa, whoa. Um, oh, hey, Prangel, what's up? Hey, you want to plan for the client services? Yeah, sure, actually, I'm, I'm actually just shooting a video right now. It's kind of funny you, you uh, jumped in. Uh, I'm doing JavaScript. Uh oh. Yeah, but yeah, we definitely well, need to plan that. Well, that works. No, no, actually, you know what? I was thinking for JavaScript, one thing we could do is how about to help our students review? I'll give you a JavaScript problem. You can then go over it with the students. You give me a Python problem, and then I'll uh, make a video with the Python problem. Well, that's a great idea. Uh... Do you know any Python? You probably don't. Uh, yeah, I know, I know Python. Come on. Come on. <laughs> All right, I'm just joking. Yeah, sure, we can do that. Okay, sure. cool. Sounds yeah. Good. All right, give me a show later and we'll go over the client services. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Bye. See ya. Okay, well, uh, that, that settles that. I guess uh, Prangel and I will be able to be doing a, an exercise together. That's kind of exciting. Uh, so, yeah, so just talking about the project, um, getting help is a key thing. And, and it's a case where you need to know when, when you've tried your best and you've, you've come up to something that you're stuck on. And at that point, now you need to reach out for help. So first, first point of contact for help is me. I'm, I'm certainly willing to uh, look over your code, to come up with suggestions, to find where you're making mistakes and give you feedback on that. One thing though that I require uh, you to do, if you're gonna send me your code and ask for help, I need you to point out the exact place in the code where you're stuck. For example, if you send me a piece of code and it's 100 or 200 lines, and you just tell me, hey, Eric, this isn't working, I need your help, that's going to require me to spend quite a bit of time, maybe half an hour, reading through your code, trying to understand it, and then running and testing it. Uh, and that's really a waste of time. If you can just give me pretty much, this is the function, this is you know where I'm stuck, these are the lines of code that I'm confused with, then that's going to save a lot of time and I'll be able to give you much better uh, advice. All right, so we'll come back to the project at the end of the video. Right now, I want to jump into working on exercise 7-1. All right, let's uh, get started on exercise 7-1. So on the D2L shell here, I'm going to go and download the chapter seven book exercises. And I'll extract uh, this folder. So the one, uh, the exercise that goes with exercise 7-1 is the rollover exercise. So I'll come in here, I'm gonna open this all up now in brackets. So I'll open up the index HTML, open up the CSS, and I'll open up the JavaScript. Okay, great. So I've got all these here. And let's, let's now, if you have the book uh, available, let's just go through each of the, the instructions. So the first one says to open it up. Well, we've done that. Let's look at number two. It tells us to review the code in the index HTML file. Note each list, list item element within the unordered list element. Each one contains a, a, a or a link element whose URL or href attribute refers to one of the images used by this application. 
So we can see that right here, we have an unordered list, and we also have um, four list items. Each of these list items contains a link. And we know that this is done to cache a bunch of images. If I were to actually go and launch this HTML page, these images are not going to be visible, right? So there's, we don't see four um, list items containing images. We only see two images uh, here. And the two that we see are the ones at the bottom of our document. So these, these four are strictly used to cache the images. Okay, so looking back at the book here, it says note the P elements at the bottom. It contains two images with IDs image one and image two. And these are the images that are currently displayed. All right, looks good. So let's move on to instruction number three. It says review the code in the rollover CSS file. And note it contains a style rule that keeps the unordered list element in the index.html file from being displayed in the browser. So if I go to the rollover CSS file, I see that I have an unordered list uh, attribute selector here, or sorry, uh, element selector. And this one has a property display none. This is what forces us to hide those four images. Okay, let's move on now to uh, number four. And it says, review the code in the rollover JS file. Note that the images with IDs image one and image two are stored in variables named image one and image two. So we see that up here that we're using the dollar sign function to get the elements by ID. We're passing in image one and image two. And if we look back at our HTML, these are the two images that are being displayed. And that makes sense. We're going to want to go and manipulate these two images by changing the source of the image when we move the mouse over and then when we move the mouse back out of the image. So we have those two variables there. Also, it mentions here, in addition, the A elements in the UR element are stored in the array named links. So that's this line of code right here. We grab an element by ID called image list. And if I go back to my HTML, image list is this unordered list that contains the four list items, which has images. Then we grab all of the elements, which are links inside our unordered list. This will be returned in an array and we store that as an array called links. Okay. Uh, step five just says use Chrome to test the application. So we've already done that. We've seen, if I fire this up, we've seen that we see these images here, but right now when I hover my mouse, I'm not seeing any behavior and that's what we're gonna add. Okay, let's move on. So step number six, it says in the onload event handler, add code that uses the links array to preload the four images used by this application. So Right here, I'm getting my array of links. So really, all I wanna do is loop through all of those links, and inside each link, I'm going to get the URL, and I'm going to create a new image that is going to use that URL, and by doing that process, I'm performing the operation of caching those images. So they'll be loaded in the computer's memory, and I can quickly retrieve them. All right, and you can see here that the code, they've given us a few variables to use. So we have a var i, and we can recognize that as a loop counter for a for loop. We also have a variable link. That will be to index into and retrieve each of the individual links inside the array. And then we have a variable image, and this will be used to create a new image for each link as we loop through the array, and to set the source attribute so that that image is preloaded. All right, so here I go. I'm gonna create my for loop. All right, and the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna now grab my link by indexing into the array. So link equals links i. And the next thing I want to do now is create a new image for each of these links. So I will say image equals new image. And now to make sure that the correct image is loaded, 
I am going to set the source attribute for each of the images. So image dot, well, image dot set attribute source. And I'll set this to the link dot get attribute href, which is the URL. Now, if we want to verify that, all I have to do is go and look at the links in my HTML, and I can see that the property that stores the image it uses an attribute href. Okay? And we know that images, when we set the source, that's what's going to be displayed. And we can see that, for example, down here. All right, so I've gone through now, and this should effectively cache all four of the images. So at this point, probably a good idea just to um, just to double check, make sure I haven't made any errors. I can hit F12 and look at my console and I, I don't have any errors there. So now I can move on to the next step. Okay, so the next step is instruction seven and this says add code to the most over and most out event handlers for the two image elements that are displayed on the page. So when I look here, I see that each image, image one and image two, they both have attached event handlers for the mouse events on mouse over and on mouse out. So essentially all I need to do is set the source attribute for these images. So when the mouse over event happens, I switch the image. And when the mouse out event happens, I switch it back. Okay, so it says here the image element with ID image one should display the release.jpg image when the mouse is over it and the hero image otherwise. So let's go ahead and do that. So when the mouse is over it, I need to set the release.jpg here. And when I move off, it sets the hero one. So all I need to do here is just modify this image source. So image one dot set attribute source. And now I just need to specify the, uh, the, the path the, or the URL to the image. So I'll go look back at my, in my HTML and for this, I can grab the URL here. So it's images slash release.jpg and I'll paste that in. And when I move off of on the most, on the most out event, I need to switch it back to the hero.jpg. So I'll, like, I can just copy this and change from release to hero. Okay. Now I could keep going. Obviously we're gonna do image two next. But let's just test where we're at. So if I hover, there we go, it's working correctly. As at the mouse over event, I change to the release.jpg and on the mouse out, it changes back to the hero.jpg. All right, let's do image two now. So for image two, it should display deer.jpg when the, the mouse is over it and bison.jpg otherwise. So I'm just gonna copy uh, this here, so on mouse over, it's going to set it to deer.jpg. Now make sure I change from image one to image two as my variable I'm modifying. And I'm changing this to deer.jpg. And then on the mouse out event, I wanna change that back to bison. Okay, so now I can go and test this out. And we can see that both of the um, images are properly transitioning, changing their image source based off of the mouse events. So this is pretty much complete at this point. There's one other thing though I want to, to show you. The way I programmed this was I used the document uh, object um, elements model. Now in chapter six, we talked about there's an HTML extension to the document object model that allows us to write code that's a little bit more efficient and it's more specific to HTML. And the difference is instead of using set attribute and get attribute, I can use the dot operator and specify the exact attribute that I'm using. Many H common HTML elements allow us to do this. So for images, you can specify the source element. And for links, you can specify the href element in this fashion. So I'm gonna go through and modify this just, just to compare and you'll see that there's quite a bit less coding I would need to do. So instead of image.set attribute, I can just go image.source equals, and instead of link.get attribute, I can just go link.href. Okay. 
Now, not all attributes allow you to do this. It's only ones that are common that are built in. If I create my own custom attribute, I can't use the syntax. So in that case, I need to use set attribute and get attribute. Right. And next up, we can go image one dot source equals, and then we can just specify our string and we can do the same thing here. And lastly, we'll do the same thing for image two. And the last one is for the mouse out event. Just missing quotes here on a few of them, so I'll fix that. Okay, excellent. So let's just try this out and make sure I didn't break anything. And of course it works the same, okay? So typically this would be a preferable way to do it, uh, but it's important to understand that, that both ways are, are fine, okay? Uh, but of course I am saving myself some typing here and usually saving typing allows the code to be a little bit more readable, which I would say it is in this case. So this is, is a preferable way of doing it. All right, so that, that's this example here. Next up, we're gonna move on to my special exercise that's going to help you finish the rest of the current lab. All right, let's uh, get started on the second exercise. So I've got uh, the materials for this posted up on D2L. It's under content and it'll be under chapter seven and it'll be under the folder Taylor Swift. So what we're gonna be making here is a slideshow, uh, and that pretty much is what you have to do for exercise 7-2. So the techniques I'm gonna show you here, you can apply them to that uh, exercise as well. So let me get everything here opened up in brackets. Okay. And let's uh, just take a look here. We have the index HTML. And if I run this, let's just take a look at what, what it's gonna look like. All right. So essentially what we're gonna create is, in, is there's an image here in the middle which isn't displaying right now. That is going to display one of eight Taylor Swift album covers. As well, we're going to change the text that says album title to the actual album, and we're gonna have these rotate through using a timer. Now, after we've got that working, I've also got a button here, and we're gonna start and stop the slideshow based off of clicks from that button. Now, as well, in that folder, oops, in that folder, I also have uh, the album covers. So basically we have eight images and I named the file the same as the text will be basically for the album cover. All right, so we have our HTML here. We also have our JavaScript uh, and we also have some CSS. So the CSS is the same as exercise 7.1 where we have an unordered list and we've set it so it doesn't display. The whole purpose of the unordered list is so we can get links to the eight images and that will allow us to cache them. So the first step we wanna do is we need to set up our unordered list, each of our list elements. We're gonna have eight of them and each one is going to be an album that Taylor Swift released. So I'm gonna go ahead here and I'm gonna copy this, so eight times, okay? And now, instead of having name of album.png and name of album, I'm gonna fill in the real values from the folder that uh, we're going to use. So this is the folder here, and I'll just go through each one. Oops. 
So I'll, I'll just be, this is just gonna be a little bit of cutting and pasting. So name of album is 1989. And the title attribute is going to be 1989. Now the second album, it should say Taylor Swift. Okay. Okay, so let's grab this one, Beautiful Eyes. And I'll paste that in. And Fearless. Holiday Collection. Uh, red. Reputation. Speak Now. and Taylor Swift. All right, so that's not, if we were to go and check out our HTML, we're not gonna see any differences yet. This is just for caching our image uh, purposes. Okay, so let's go ahead now, and that's probably the operation we should do first, is caching our images. So here's my JavaScript. I have my dollar sign function and my window on load. So this is going to be pretty much identical to what we just did in exercise 7.1. Uh, I'm going to need to grab a um, array of all of the link elements that are inside the unordered list. So the first thing I want to do is grab a reference to the HTML element that contains the, um, the list element. So that is the unordered list and the ID is image list. Okay. So I will say dollar sign, well, var, uh, in this case, links equals, and that is image list, and it is get elements by tag name. I'm going to grab all of the A or link tags, all right? So that's going to basically grab all eight of the list items, or, or sorry, of the links. Uh, that are inside the unordered list. So the next step is to loop through that list and for every image, I'm going to create, basically create a new image uh, that'll cache that image. So here we go, I'll just do a for loop for and I'm going to create another variable, so let link equals links i and I'm also going to now create an image so let image equals new image and now I'm going to set the source for the image equal to the link uh, URL or href and that should uh, cache all of those images so at this point we can uh, continue on so I guess really we're at the stage now where we need to set up uh, the slideshow. And before I do that though, how about I fix up this HTML? Because right now when I look at my HTML, I don't have an actual album displaying and I don't have an album title. So I can just change this. I'll just take 1989 and I will place that uh, for the album. And there we go, okay. So if I preview now, at least my, this is what my site is gonna look like. And I now just need to put in my, my timer that will loop through all of the albums. Now, of course, we are gonna hook this up to the start stop button, and we could do this in one step. But what I suggest is let's split this problem up. Let's do the slideshow first, just get it running automatically, and then we'll come back and we'll hook up the button. Okay, so the two, we can just take note here, the image that we want to uh, manipulate has an ID of image, and the text or the, the header element that we want to change with the title of the album, it has an ID of caption. So we can remember these uh, for when we're writing our JavaScript. Okay, 
So let's go ahead and actually create those two variables. So I'm gonna say var uh, display image equals dollar sign image and var, uh, I'll call this uh, display title equals dollar sign caption. Okay, so at this point, we're looking to actually now set, set up our timer. So we need to set up, in this case, an interval timer, which is one that will repeat as, as we go. So I'm going to create another variable, and I'm going to call this var timer. So this is going to store the, the, ret the result when we create our timer. This way, if we need to stop it later on, we can do that. So here I'm gonna say timer equals set interval. And inside my set interval, there's two parameters. The first one is going to be a function that is going to get called whenever the timer has its event triggered. And the other one is going to be the uh, interval, how often it's going to get called. So we could use a function expression here but in this case, I'm going to use an anonymous function. And this is the syntax for that. So function, and then a parenthesis, or a bracket. Okay. And inside, when every time the timer runs, I want to basically update what image is showing. So I'm gonna create a variable. And that's the index of the current image. I'll start it at zero. So I'll be looking at the first image, 1989. And when it comes into here, I'm going to increment current image. So current image equals current image plus one. Uh, and the only issue here is if I keep incrementing it, eventually I'm gonna run off the end of my array. There are only eight albums that I have here. So once I go past, the eighth album, I'm going to crash my, my script. So I need to do modulo arithmetic. So I'm going to take current image and I'm going to um, use, basically take do the modulo operator with the length of the array. So I'm taking the remainder of the division operation. Uh, that way I will reset my value. So once I get to the end of the array, I'll reset back to zero. So current image equals current image mod, and in this case it's links.length. And now based off of the current image, I'm going to set my um, variables here, my display image and my display title. So I'm gonna say display image.source equals links current image dot href and I'm gonna say display title dot and in this case dot um, okay so the display title if I look at my HTML my display title here is a header two and it has a child which is a text element so I need to take that in consideration so I'm gonna go display title dot child first child, okay, dot node value equals, and I'm gonna say links current image dot title. And if I look back here at my links, I have a title attribute uh, as part of the link. And that would be what you would see if you hover over the link. So this is one that I can use the HTML DOM extension with. Uh, it gives me the ability to do a short form here to save typing. All right, so I've set that, and now I should be able to go and take a look and, and see if my um, slideshow is running. Okay, it definitely is, whoa. Okay, so the issue here is I forgot to specify uh, a interval. So I come into my set interval, and I gave it the first parameter, which is the function that's going to run, but I forgot to give it the second one, which is gonna be the milliseconds between each uh, album being displayed. So I'm gonna change that to a thousand milliseconds and now let's see what's doing. Okay, there we go. So now it's moving through all of the albums and it's gonna just keep looping. 
So the last step here is I need to now set up my start stop button. And that should be fairly straightforward. Basically, I'm gonna add a click event to this button. And inside that click event, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna detect whether or not the slideshow is running. If it's running, I'm gonna stop it. If it's not running, I'm going to start it. Okay, so let's look at my HTML. And the input button has an ID of convert. That's not a very good ID. So let's change this to toggle show for my ID. And now we can go and grab that variable. So dollar sign toggle show uh, dot on click equals, and we will do a function, um, anonymous function for this as well. And inside my function, now, probably a good idea here at this point, I might as well just do a console log, just to make sure my clicks are being uh, captured. So I hit F12, and now every time I hit the start stop, okay, we can see that my clicks are being uh, captured here, which is good. So we can go back and now actually do the meaningful work I want. So in this case, I need to check to see if timer has been started or not. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to set, when timer is not running, I'm gonna set it, the timer to null. When it is running, it'll have a valid value, essentially. So I come in here and I say if timer equals null. In that case, I'm going to start the timer, else I'm going to stop it. So to start the timer, I would basically grab this code here, and this is going to run. So timer is being set through the set, set interval call. and that will start these, the uh, timer event. Otherwise, if timer is already running, then I need to use the clear interval and I pass it timer as the parameter. That's going to stop the actual timer and then I can say timer equals null. That way when the button is clicked again, it'll come to here and it'll realize that the slideshow has been stopped and it'll then start it up again. All right, so I think we're ready to try this out. So as we can see now, uh, when I first load this up, the timer will not run. I click start stop button and it's still not running. Oh, no, okay, I didn't click, it was just I didn't click it. Okay, now, now it's running, I can now stop it. Okay, and then start it up and stop it. Okay, it looks good. So the, the really the last thing that I see here is this button. The button says start slash stop. That's not very good user interface. It's not really clear what the button's gonna do. It would be much better if the button said either start or stop depending upon the situation. So let's go ahead and let's, let's change this. So when I look at my HTML, I've already got the button. It has an ID of toggle show. And the value, it represents the text that's set. So I can easily set that attribute in my JavaScript. So when I come in here, if the timer is null, that means I'm going to start the timer. So I'm gonna say dollar sign, and this is toggle show dot set attribute value, so this would be if you want to stop it, just double check I got that right, yeah, toggle show, and then the other one would be if you want to start it, okay, and we know that when we first start, when we first load this page, we are not starting the slideshow, so I'm going to set the attribute to start to begin with. So let's take a look now. Now we can see the button says start. I click it, it says stop. We can see the slideshow running. And then I can go ahead and click on stop and the button changes its state back to start. All right, so that's gonna conclude this exercise.
Now this exercise is very, very similar to the book exercise for the lab, 7-2. So I recommend you guys look through this and use this as a guide when you go through and do your lab exercise. Okay, so that's, I'm gonna stop here for, for this exercise then. Hi, so for this uh, section of my video today, I'm gonna go through the project. Now I've been hearing, hearing back from several of you saying that you're finding the project really difficult. Uh, so really the, the strategies that we have available uh, to overcome this, the first one is to reach out to me for help. Keep in mind that when you do this, I need to know exactly what to look for. These projects are gonna be at least 100 lines of code. So to give me 100 lines of code with the expectation that I can quickly you know, figure out where the issue is, uh, isn't very realistic. It could take me quite a bit of time to, to go through all each line of code. So uh, what I really need is for you to tell me specifically which function or which part of the project you're stuck on. And that way I'll be able to focus what, what I'm looking for. The second thing is with your code, I recommend going back and looking at the first uh, JavaScript video on YouTube where I explain my algorithm and I show you the basic code. So a few students have sent me some code which contains typos and mistakes uh, from that session. So make sure you compare your code with what I posted in that video uh, because if you have a mistake in, in what you copied, that's gonna cause a lot of problems, obviously. All right, so the other suggestion I have is this. If you're finding the problem too difficult, a good strategy is always to subdivide, to take out part of the problem and solve it first. In this case, what I suggest you do is get your calculator working with only plus and minus, and don't worry about division and multiplication. That can come later. So in that case, let's talk about the three variables that my algorithm uh, requires. The first one is formula elements. The second one is original formula elements. And the last one is current number. All right. So if we're going to take the approach of only doing addition and subtraction first, then that means we can eliminate formula elements. Okay. We don't have to think about that. And that, I think this is going to be a really good step because that's the most complex part of the algorithm. Now we only have two variables which we're going to worry about. The original formula elements is going to contain the formula exactly how the user types it in. So if they go five plus six minus three and they hit equals, that's what the, the array is going to contain. Each of the various entries the person made while they created their formula. Current number, as we know, is what we store the number the person is in the progress of pressing. So let's look at original formula elements for a specific example. Let's say the person enters 44 plus 16 minus 3, and then they hit the equals. Okay? So that's going to be their formula. Original formula elements is going to be an array. So I'm going to go over here and let's draw our original formula elements array. So we notice up top, this is index zero, and as we add elements, we move down uh, the board as we add them to the array. All right, so let's go through this algorithm. The first thing that happens is the person fires up the calculator and they hit a four. So current number, we enter in that that, that, that variable now stores a four. Now we don't know, if the, is the person done entering numbers or are they gonna hit an operator like plus or minus? It turns out they hit another four. So now we concatenate the two fours together and we get 44. At this point, our original formula elements array, we haven't added anything into it. We only add things into the original formula elements if the person hits the equal sign or one of the operators. 
All right, so now we're waiting again. Maybe the person's gonna add another number and we're gonna build up our current number or not. In this case, they hit the plus sign. So at this point, we know that we're done adding on to this number. So they hit the plus sign. What we now do is we have a number here and we enter that into our original formula elements and we have an operator plus. In addition, we know that this number 44 has now been stored in our array and we reset this variable. Okay, so we set it, well, if, in fact, we reset it to the empty string. All right, now, now we continue waiting for input. At this point, we're expecting the user to press a number. They press one. So our current number, we update this to be one. Now we're waiting. They might enter an operator or a number. In this case, they enter six. So we concatenate six into that string. Now the current number is represented as 16, and we're once again waiting for them to input. Now they hit the negative symbol for subtraction. So in this case, we know that we're done entering numbers. So we can now go and enter our number 16, and we can enter a minus symbol into our original formula elements. We know that we're done with the current number variable, so we reset it back to the empty string. All right, at this point, once again, we're waiting for the user to enter numbers. In this case, they hit three, so we store that in our current number. And we're waiting once again. Now, in this case, they hit the equal sign. So at this point, we know that we're done grabbing our number, we're done entering numbers, and we're also done entering this formula. So at this point, we place the three here, and now we're ready to solve this formula. 44 plus 16 minus 3. So we can easily pass our original formula elements to a function that will loop through and will calculate the value. All right. So by removing uh, the multiplication and division, we've subdivided our problem. This is going to allow us to write you know, most of the functions and test them and verify that they're working. And then the last step will be to go back and do the multiplication and division. So I'm gonna switch now to the computer and we'll go through, we'll go through and uh, we'll, we'll add a little bit of code to our functions uh, from the, the code that we wrote in the previous video. All right, let's uh, get started here. So what I've got on my screen is the same um, code that we left off with in the first JavaScript video. I have my formula elements, my original formula elements, my current number. These are the global variables I'm going to use. I have my handle input function. I have my handle number press, handle operator press, handle eval press, handle clear press, uh, input handlers. Uh, I have my show screen output, which will display stuff to the text. I have a display string uh, get display string function, which will loop through my original formula elements and will create a string with my formula. And I have my window on load here. So the first thing I'm going to show you guys is the idea of writing one function at a time and testing it thoroughly before moving on. So the function I'm going to write is going to be get display string. And what this function does is it loops through, as I said, the original formula elements, it creates an array and returns it. So this is a very simple function. So I can go here and I can say, I'm gonna create a variable. So let um, display value is the empty string to start with. And now I am going to loop through my uh, original formula elements. And for each item in the original formula elements, I'm going to concatenate it with display value. And then I'm going to return my display value. Right. So in addition, we also have the show screen output function. And last video, or the, the first video, I showed you how to quickly test it. So I can simply call show screen output Eric. And if I go and reload my calculator, okay, it's not showing 
show screen output, I'm not sure why. Let's try that again. Okay, there we go, I just hadn't saved it. So we've got Eric is being displayed there, which is great. But now we wanna actually test the new function we just wrote, which is get display string. So one way I can do that is I can hard code or pre-initialize my original string elements array. So I can come in here and I can say original formula elements equals, and I'm gonna put in my formula. So I'll use the formula that we just did on the whiteboard, and that's gonna be 44 plus 16, minus 3. And at this point, I can then um, call get display string if I want, and I can use that to output to the screen. So I can go show screen output, and then I can call get display string. And now, if I run my calculator, there we go, okay? So this is one way. Another uh, idea that I could use to um, would be console log. So I could come in here and in get display string, I could go console.log, and I could then type in display value. And I can also console log the original formula elements. That way I can compare them, and make sure that they are in fact the same. So here we go, I can see that I have my display string here, and now I have my original formula elements, and I can verify that those are in fact the same. So using console logs, also creating test data and calling your functions with it, these are two strategies I've just shown you, and they're very, very powerful. One of the things you want to avoid is writing a whole bunch of code, and then finally going and testing it. You want to be testing your code as you're going through the development process. That way, when you need to ask for help, you know where the help needs to be. If you've written 10 functions, you've written 100 or more lines of code, and all of a sudden you realize it doesn't work, it's hard to get help because you have to basically go to someone and say, hey, here's a whole bunch of code. It doesn't work, right? Kind of like throw your hands in the air. It's a lot better if you can say, I have this one function here, I don't know why, but it's not working properly, can you take a look at it? And there might only be 10 lines of code there, it's a lot easier to check over. All right, so that's the first thing we want, we, I wanted to show everyone. Now the next part is, let's, let's take a look at how we would actually go about um, adding a bit of functionality here for, the, for, for only doing the addition and subtraction. So I'm just gonna remove my hard-coded value here, and I will also remove my, my test code. Actually, I'll just comment it out, because maybe I might wanna come back to it later. All right, so I've got that done. Uh, so now, let's actually go through the, the situation. So the situation that we're gonna have is going to be, I'll just put a comment here, it's gonna be 44 plus 16 minus three. That's the, the example I did on the board with everyone. Let's read through the code and see what would happen. So essentially, we fire up the calculator and we're waiting for someone to input. And we know that the first thing we're expecting is going to be a number. So when it comes into here, handle input is called. And in this case, if it's an operator, that would not be what we would be expecting. We're expecting a number. So it should come in and then go into handle number press. Okay, that's, I got, that was a, a little bit of code. I should have had that removed, actually. Let me just remove this. Pretend that's not there. We'll come back to that later. So it's gonna come into hand, handle number press. Let, they've entered four, okay? The first number is hit four. Handle number press is gonna get called. Do we agree? Make sure you guys are following this, because it's very important. Handle number press is, is called, and we get the input. The input is going to be the actual button that was pressed. In this case, it'll be four. So we come into handle number press, and what do we want to do? Do we want to add to original uh, formula elements? Uh, we could go original formula elements dot push number entered. Is that correct? All right? That is not correct because we know, we don't know if the person's done entering their number. So we want to wait till they're done entering their number before we, we place that in the array. So instead, we want to take our value current number and we want to concatenate, add whatever number they've added 
to the current current number. All right? There we go. We've added current number. Now, if the person keeps adding, if they add another four, that's going to come in here and it's going to get added. Now, as we do that, we should console.log this. We can console.log current number. Now we can go test it out. So I go back out here and I hit two. All right? So my current number is two. Now I hit three. So my current number is 23. Now I hit four, 234. Okay? So I'm, right now I'm happy. It looks like things are working the way I want them to. Now we know at some point the person is going to hit a plus or minus. So in that case, it's going to come into handle operator press. So we now need to go and look at handle operator press. Now, when the example I did on the board, you guys can re rewind the video, okay? And you can look at what we actually have to store. If you remember, as soon as they hit an operator, we need to take whatever the current number is and we need to place that into our original formula elements. And then we need to take that operator and place it into our original formula elements. So that's gonna be two lines of code. So I'm gonna go original formula elements dot push and I'm gonna say current number. Then I'm gonna go original formula elements dot push and I'm gonna go operator, right? And at this point, I can now do a console log. So I can go console.log original formula elements. Right, so let's, uh, let's try that out. So I come in here, I go 33, and this log here is just logging my current number, and then I go minus, and at this point, my array is updated, so I see 33 and minus in my original formula elements. Now I type two. Okay, unfortunately, we see an error right away. Look, I'm seeing 332, and that's my current number. So I missed a step here. I forgot to reset my current number. So inside handle operator press, because we know we're done with whatever number we were entering, we need to take current number and we need to set it to the empty string. All right, so at this point now, I can load this up. Now, let, let, how about I do the, the original algorithm I did on the board? So 44 plus, and now I'm gonna go 16 minus, and I'm gonna go three. Now, when I hit the equal sign, the only problem is I need to also add handling there. So right now, my original formula elements has 44 plus 16 minus. My current number is currently has three in it. When I hit the equal sign, right now, there's nothing in that code. So if I go back here and handle eval press, I'm not doing anything. So essentially, eval press should basically do something very similar to operator press. It's going to take the current number and it's going to add it to the original formula elements. It should also reset the current number and it's probably a good idea to log the original formula elements. So at this point I can go back in and I can go 44 plus 16 minus three equals, and there we go, I can see my values are properly stored now. So at this point, really, I um, need to display on my screen, which I, I am actually, um, the values as I'm entering them, and I need to add an evaluation routine that I can pass my original formula elements to, it'll loop through and it'll calculate the result. So let's take a quick look. This, I have 44 plus 16 minus as my display. Let's see where that's coming from. So I'm calling show screen output somewhere. Where am I doing that? Okay, I'm doing it here. So show screen output, get display string. Uh, so essentially, get display string, as we know, it grabs the uh, original formula elements. It takes all of the individual array elements and concatenates them into a string and then displays that. So I want to do this every time the user enters something. That way I can update the, uh, the string uh, that's being displayed on the calculator. So when they hit the multiplication, division, addition, whatever operator, I know that I want to display that. I also want to display it after they hit the eval press. So I'll do that there. 
and I want to do it also after they hit the number press. Now the only problem is when after they hit the hit enter in a number, the only problem is that number doesn't get entered into the original formula elements. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to go 44 and you can see that my number isn't being displayed. Even though I'm calling get display string, right now there's nothing in my original formula elements. This is the array right here and there's nothing in it. So I'm going to go 44 and now I go plus and now it's being added to the array and you can see it's displayed properly. And I'm gonna go 16 and I'm gonna go minus, which, is, which now updates the display, three, and then I'm gonna go equals. And now it's displayed properly. So you can see that the only issue we have is when we hit a number, we need to add that into our display and we're not doing that right now. And that's a really simple fix. All we have to do is go to uh, our handle number press and instead of saying show screen output get display string, we can go get display string plus current number. So whatever the current number variable is, that's going to be added on to the string that's already in the original elements. And now when we run our calculator, I go 44, and you can see that being entered. Uh, and then we go plus 16, and then minus 3, and then equals, and we see our result there. So the next step really is to now go and write a routine that will take the original formula elements and it will return the calculated value uh, from doing the arithmetic. So in this case, it would be 44 uh, plus 16. So that is gonna equal 60 minus three is gonna be 57. So you should be able to pass original formula elements to this function and you should get back 57. Now, when you write this function, you can easily go and create a bunch of test elements by initializing original formula elements to different values and then calling it and logging the result and verifying that what you're doing is correct. Now the actual function that you'll have to do this with is going to be, um, I guess you'll have to add one. So we have right now handle eval press. You could do it inside handle eval press, but you probably want to add another function here which is var calculate result uh, equals function. And what's going to happen inside here is you're going to loop through the original formula elements array. You're then going to take all the numbers and perform the operation. And then you're going to return the value that you calculated. So in other words, I could do something like this in handle eval press. I would do something like this. I would go let um, calculation equal calculate result. And then I would say display, um, where's my show screen output? I would then go show screen output and I would pass it calculation, okay? Now, in our case right now, we're not returning anything. So just to make this example work, I will return 57, okay? So obviously you would have code here that would, would handle this, but I, I don't, I'm gonna leave that to you. But in, in my case, just to demonstrate how this would work, I can now go 44 uh, plus 16 minus three equals, okay? So I, I did something wrong here. So handle eval press is gonna go show screen output calculation. Uh, and I see the problem here. In my handle eval press, I'm then overwriting it by saying get display string. So I'll just comment that out and I'll run this again. 44 plus 16 minus three equals 57, All right? All right, so I'm gonna stop here. Uh, I've, I think I've given you guys some good tips. Uh, some strategies that you can use to try to improve uh, you know, how you tackle this problem. Definitely, please, if you're stuck, reach out to me. You're welcome to send me your code, but please specify this is the area uh, that I'm stuck in. Also, I recommend you go back through my videos and make sure you don't have any typos. Compare your code to what I've posted because if you have a small typo there, that's gonna be very difficult to, to find. Also, as you begin to add new functionality with new functions, 
test each function as you go by using test data and also by using console logs. Okay, well that uh, concludes this video.